18 years ago, Doreen and Neville Lawrence embarked upon a journey no parent would ever want to make. Their horrific story began on the 22nd of April 1993, when their 18-year-old son, Stephen Lawrence, was stabbed and murdered by white racist youths. Within days, the police had the names of five suspects. Did you kill Stephen Lawrence? No, I did not. Because I can't remember, does that make me guilty? No! And today, two of them, Gary Dobson and David Norris, were found guilty of the murder of Stephen Lawrence. We hadn't done anything. It was just because we were black. This is a crime which has reverberated through society, helped change the legal system, and which heaped humiliation on the Metropolitan Police. It was like sitting in the stocks, and it hurt. You know, can't believe this is an organisation I've spent 37 and a half years in being criticised like this. But the biggest impact has been on Stephen's family, who've waited 18 years to see justice for their murdered son. It was as if Stephen was being murdered over and over again. And that is what Doreen and Neville have had to put up with. The initial police investigation was so deeply flawed, it allowed Dobson and Norris to escape justice. This case was a scar on the face of criminal justice. And it is only now, 18 years later, and thanks to advances in forensic science, a microscopic drop of blood on Gary Dobson's jacket. That blood drop comes back with a full DNA profile saying it's Stephen Lawrence's blood. And fibres from Stephen's clothing found on items seized from David Norris proved conclusively that these two men were guilty of murder. They had 18 years of freedom and the ability to walk the streets, which they didn't deserve. The failure of the police stirred emotions in the wider public. Police officers are human beings. They suffer from all the frailties of, of human beings. But it all started in Eltham 18 years ago when an innocent teenager lost his life. Stephen Lawrence was the eldest of three children. He was born into a church-going family and was well known to his local vicar. He was very comfortable in his own skin. He was very outgoing, you know, he, he was belonged to the Cambridge Harriers, he was a sprinter, he, um, he enjoyed music, he enjoyed life. He was a delightful human being. He was a, a, a good guy, got on with everybody, um, didn't have an enemy in in the school at all. Uh, well liked by the teachers. So he's one of those those goody goody guys. His parents were Jamaican immigrants who believed in improving their lot through hard work. Doreen and, and Neville were people who wanted to get on, and I think they um, bred into their kids an attitude that it, there may be difficulties being black in Britain, but if you keep your head down, really and work hard, uh, you'll get somewhere. And uh, I think that was, you know, Stephen's attitude, it was the family's attitude. They were a happy family, three lovely children, united. Um, and and this, this, this was just a, a, a terrible sort of arrow through the heart, really. The family lived in Eltham in South London, a place which has seen its fair share of racial tensions. The area where Stephen grew up was notorious for racism. You get relatively small numbers of black and minority ethnic families living in a sea of white, poorly educated people. And that's, that's the recipe for significant racism. It was scary because you don't know what could happen to you. You'd always get some car driving past and someone would shout out the words nigger or black bastard or what are you doing in Eltham? On the night of Stephen's murder, he and Dwayne had been out together and were travelling back across Eltham heading home. Stephen had promised his parents he'd be in by 10.30. It's a little after half past 10, so Stephen is late. The curfew has passed, as it were. 
Um, he knows he's only 10 or 15 minutes from home. Uh, if the bus comes, he'll be there in no time. They got to the bus stop and they were waiting for the bus. And it was taking a long time. So they walked around the corner to see if the bus was coming. I shouted out to Steve, can you see the bus? To my left, on the other side of the road, was a group of six white boys. And the response that came back was, what, what, nigger? And at that moment in time, the person who I presume had shouted out, what, what, nigger, then began to draw a weapon out from his trousers. She ran! You know, I ran, and to my surprise and you know, disappointment, Steve hadn't run. They caught up with Stephen in, in an attack that seemed to have been over in a very few seconds. Uh, he received two fatal stab wounds. The pathologist at Stephen Lawrence's autopsy was clear. Both injuries were inflicted with a massive amount of force. The first was on his, the left side of his arm, on the outside of his arm, and the track of that injury came from the left to the right into his chest, upper chest cavity, and it cut through a major blood vessel and nerve just behind the left collarbone. The injury to the right side lay just in front of his right, the middle part of his right collarbone, and went straight downwards. Once again, it cut through this major blood vessel and the major nerve fibre on the right-hand side. And both tracks went into the body about five inches deep. So as I've run back to him and he's jumped up, it was an amazing sense of relief at that time, on top of the relief that I had that they'd run off. Come back, come on! I'm telling you, coming back, come on! And it was not until we was running up the road that I realised that, you know, something else had happened. He was running awkwardly. His voice became you know, fainter uh, as we were running, and you know, I was just begging him just to run just that little bit more. And you know, he called my name one more time, and you know, the way he said it, just you know, stopped me. In a, in a sense, I was still running, but the way he said it stopped me, and he just fell. No, Steve, man! Come on, baby, baby girl! Come on, sit on front of him! Come on, man! The two wounds that Stephen received are unusual. They damage blood vessels that are normally quite well protected and very seldom damaged by stabbing injuries. And then the 200 yards, as he ran, he would be bleeding more and more internally and externally. Eventually, he would collapse through shock, and that would be the beginning of the end. The next thing for me was to get help. I knew there was a phone box across the road because we travelled that way a number of occasions. So I just dialed 999. At the same time, a passing couple stopped to comfort Stephen. Dwayne is very concerned about getting him to hospital. And uh, he's looking down the road and up the road for an ambulance. He wants to see that blue light. But it wasn't an ambulance that was first on the scene. It was the police. <laughs> Having made assumptions about Dwayne based on the color of his skin, they failed to respond to the information about the attackers he was desperately trying to give them. <laughs> Every time a new officer spoke to me, they would ask me the same question as before. And actually, I'd be frustrated. Why do you keep asking me the same questions? You know, my friend's dying. I told them where the gang went, where they ran, um, how many people they were. I did the best that I could. Precious time was being wasted. While the police questioned Dwayne, his attackers were disappearing into the night, and Stephen's life was draining away by the side of the road. There wasn't any any um, first aid given. There wasn't any attempt to stem the flow of blood. It was just a massive sense of helplessness. For me, um, not being able to help my friend, who I knew was dying. 
he had beside him this couple. She was kneeling and praying and, and saying, Stephen, you are loved. You are loved. And he uh, was breathing. His breathing became more and more shallow. At 10.54 p.m., nine minutes after Duane's initial 999 call, the ambulance arrived. The crew comes out, turns him over, puts him on a trolley, um, and you could clearly see that he was drenched um, in his own blood. The paramedics found no vital signs, no breathing, no heartbeat. Stephen Lawrence was dead. He certainly died by the side of the road, uh, with, you know, within feet of the passing cars. So the police officers who are on the spot know, I think they should have done the first day, but actually I know now, that having seen the autopsy, obviously, we now know that nothing would have saved Stephen Lawrence. He had very such deep stab wounds and the internal bleeding was so appalling he was going to die anyway. But they didn't know that. It was now a murder investigation. The police had already made many critical mistakes and many more were to come in a case that was to have a profound impact on the law, the Met and British society. At 11.03 p.m. on the 22nd of April, 1993, Stephen Lawrence was in an ambulance after being stabbed by racist youths. Resuscitation was being attempted, but the truth was that Stephen was already dead. One of the people at the bus stop who boarded the bus saw Stephen lying by the side of the road, and he was a near neighbor. And when he got home, he told his father that he'd seen this, and the father brought him straight round to the Lawrences. The Lawrences immediately got in their car and went to the scene. Didn't see anything. They thought they'd go straight to the hospital. I've got no another pulse, one on no. this side. OK, no a... pulse. Let's start chest compressions. What you've got there? I've got another one, which is an L shift, which well, on that side, which is also three. sucking. Okay. Very soon after their arrival at the hospital, Neville and Doreen were told that their son had died. <laughs> Meanwhile, the police presence at the murder scene was growing. But a failure by those officers to work in a coordinated manner meant that as the seconds passed, the case was already beginning to slip away from them. One always talks in terms of crimes of murder of the golden period. That's the period immediately after the crime has been committed when the police are supposed to secure the scene and search for evidence. The police still believed they were responding to a fight, and as a result, they failed to establish the true sequence of events, still regarding Duane as a perpetrator rather than a victim. Duane was still at the scene. He was clearly very traumatized. He represented a, a very challenging witness to get the story as to what had happened. However, you know, that challenge has to be met. The way I was treated at the scene, it's not how a victim of crime should be treated. There was that feeling that I was treated as, as a suspect. Having failed to establish what exactly had happened, the police went off in the wrong direction to a local pub along Wellhall Road. Police officers all going off in the wrong direction, looking for the wrong evidence, at the crucial time just the night of the murder. Duane was absolutely right. They should have gone up Dixon Road, and they didn't. I was asked, you know, if I had any weapons on me, or did we carry any weapons? And I was asked if Stephen carried any weapons. And... Critically, as more officers arrived, it seemed that there was a lack of control and vision. And there was a telling remark by one of the police constables about seeing a lot of senior officers standing around with their hands on their hips, as if they were just there rather than doing anything useful. Later that night, the police questioned Duane at Plumstead Police Station. Duane was absolutely key to understanding what had happened to Stephen. He was also a victim because he was a, a surviving victim of a racist attack. We hadn't done anything except tried to get home. We're attacked. Steve dies. 
it was just because we were black. And, and, and 